Well, we don't really know anything about Curtis Gardner. He was from Milwaukee. He was a Class A player, and that's all I really know. It was the first round. This would have been the 29th of November, 1957. And he began the game with D4. So let's get it going. Of course, Knight F6 from Fisher. Knight F3. And we have G6. This counts as an East Indian defense unless C4 is played. And then it's a King's Indian. With G3, we have Prezepiorka's variation, named for David Prezepiorka. Very sad story regarding Prezepiorka. He was a prominent Jewish player, born 22nd December 1880. So we are one week shy of the anniversary of his birth. He was born in Warsaw, which at that time was part of the Russian Empire. And um, he learned to play chess at age seven on his own. No one in his family knew anything about chess. And so he was already recognized as a prodigy by the time he was nine years old. And he managed not long thereafter to defeat Jan Taubenhaus, a fairly well-known chess master of that day and age. Prezepiorka's career began in 1926 as far as his professional chess career. He became the first Polish champion winning at Warsaw, and he won a fairly notable tournament in Munich, Germany, ahead of Rudolf Spielmann, ahead of Jefem Begoyabov, also at the World's Amateur Championship in 1928. He came in second place behind only Dr. Max Erwe. Two years later, he was part of the Polish team at the Olympiad in Hamburg, and they won the gold medal. He was teammates with the likes of Akiva Rubinstein, Savieli Tartakova, Kazimierz Makarczyk, and Paulin Friedman. They took the silver medal at the Olympiad in Prague, only beaten by a single point. The U.S. team won that year. But he was very popular among the Polish chess community and was deputy chairman of the Polish Chess Federation in the 1930s. But in the 1939 invasion of Poland, his apartment was destroyed. He moved to share an apartment with a fellow chess player and a close collaborator, Vrobel, Marian Vrobel, and that apartment was subjected to a Gestapo raid in 1940. Nothing was going on but an informal meeting of Warsaw chess players, but they were all arrested. The non-Jewish participants were released a week later. But Prezepiorka and all the Jewish players, including Stanislav Kohn, Moishe Lovsky, Prezepiorka's son-in-law, Jakub Rabinovitz, they were all executed. We don't know the exact date of his death. So, very, very, very sad story about David Prezepiorka, and we're reminded of him with this move, G3, Prezepiorka's variation. And I constantly want to remind us of these tragic tales of the Holocaust, because if we forget history, it will repeat itself. And isn't all this crisis in Israel a stark example? How many people are coming out in support of Hamas against Israel is astonishing. And the truth is, if Hamas were to lay down their arms, there'd be peace tomorrow. But if Israel were to lay down their arms, the second Holocaust would begin tomorrow. Now, I should hasten to say that the opinions expressed on this channel by this host are not necessarily those of Chess.com or Twitch. Let's continue with the game. Prezepiorka's variation. Now Bishop G7 and Bishop G2 forms the Tartakovers attack. Both sides castle. Pawn d6 here, pawn c3, and the queen's knight comes to d7. Queen's knight to d2, pawn e5, pawns are traded on e5, and now pawn e4. More common than pawn e4, it gets a star there, you can see it's not a bad move, but there are other moves more common than e4. The most common is knight c4, and another sound approach that's also somewhat common is queen c2. In this game, Curtis Gardner with e4. Pawn b6 is played, 
And uh, that gets an inaccuracy, but it's the most frequently played move. Queen c2 here, also marked inaccurate, but again, it is the move most frequently played in this position. Queen e7, b3. And you can see here as the players are finishing their development that it's pretty equal. Bishop b7, a4, king's rook to d8, take that open file. Here's a principle for my students, Valerie and Twizzler and others. Rooks like open files. Get those rooks on the open file and double your rooks on the open file. Learn this lesson from Bobby Fisher. Bishop a3 hits the queen here, and the queen moves to the safety of the e6 square. King's rook to e1, and bishop to f8, putting the question to its counterpart there. And that question is answered with a trade. Bishop takes bishop, king takes bishop. Now knight c4 is played. And not sure what's wrong with that move. The eval bar is still dead center, but Ficklebot being persnickety again. Knight e8, no doubt he wants to push here. That gets the big red X, a5 being called for him. Uh, actually, I had my sights on pawn h6 to deter the knight from coming here. That's marked inaccurate, but... That was in my mind, and uh, I haven't been faring too well with Ficklebot over the last week or so. Well, two weeks ago, I had those seven brilliancies, so I blasted all at once, and, and now I'm paying for it with inaccuracies and derogatory marks from the annotator. Queen's Rook to D1 was played here, and I thought uh, with that Rook, you know, you've pushed your pawn the bot indicating a5, maybe white can play a5. I liked this move. Let's see what we get. Nah! Uh, anyway, knight e8 was played here. Oh, I, I accidentally didn't go back. It was here that I liked a5. That gets a thumbs up. I accidentally didn't retract this move. I just played the rook right away. But here the guy went rook a d1. f6. So, redemption on that one. Here h4 was played, and I was thinking perhaps he should reassign his bishop. Ah, inaccurate. h4 getting the thumbs up. Knight c5, king's knight to d2, and queen to e7. But getting this knight back into play should be considered. Queen's knight to e7 is given a inaccuracy. What does the bot think about reintroducing the knight? We get a thumbs up there. Queen e7 is the choice from young Bobby Fisher. Now knight b2. Here, I'd be very tempted, if I'm white, to play b4. Hit this knight. We get a thumbs up for that. That would force the knight to e6. And then again, I like a5 here. Okay, that all looks good to the bot. Knight b2 was Gardner's choice. Bishop c8, Bobby reassigning his bishop. Yeah, a5 looks great to me here. Gets an x glam. Bobby with bishop c8. Now king h2, b4 again being recommended. Well, I say again, I recommended it the first time. The bot recommending it this time. That would compel the knight to retreat. Might as well come to b7 here. I get a star. And then, yeah, open this file up. Inaccurate. King h2 also held in disdain by the annotator. Bishop g4 hits this rook. Here a5 actually looks great as well, by the way, I would think. Yeah, star. But bishop g4, f3, and bishop back to e6. That creates a super attack. It is twice defended. Now bishop f1 is played. Knight d6 is finally played, and the knight on b2 comes back to c4. And again, b4 makes sense, doesn't it? Queen f7, battery attacks, so that's quite a threat. Battery and super attacks, the b-man, kind of putting a pin-ish on the knight here. 
Knight takes the knight. And to my surprise, Bobby played pawn takes the knight. Rooks love to be on open files. I just said it. And that got a question mark, as you can see. Best is to take with the rook and then double those rooks, baby. I'm a little confused by that capture. I gather maybe he's going to attack on the C file, since that's where his opponent's queen is. I don't know. Uh, of course, here, no doubt, white would finally play the B pawn and hit the knight. But you might even be able to get cute here. Play knight to B3. I get a check mark. Anyway, Bobby captured with the pawn. Bishop C4, pawn D5, pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn. Bishop takes bishop, and the rook takes the bishop. So he did get that rook lifted after all. Now knight c4. Knight e4 would have been my choice, creating a little more pressure and getting to the center of the board. Let's see what I get for knight e4. I get a check mark. The bot's still calling for this pawn move. Curtis with knight c4 gets a question mark from the bot. Well, queen's rook comes to d8. Rook takes the rook, and queen takes the rook. King g2 is played here, and I do like rook e3. Queen d3, queen b2, rook d7, rook e2. a5 would have been worth a try. This is starting to look pretty good for Bobby Fischer. Well, the problem with this move, I don't know if you see it. Maybe I'll give you a minute while I sip another coffee here. Why does this get a question mark? What problem does rook e2 create? Very good, Valerie. Valerie points out that the queen is overworked and the knight can take the pawn with impunity, which is what Bobby played. Can't take the knight without losing your rook with tempo, probably losing the game. So that's what Bobby plays, getting an exclam. Valerie, give yourself an exclam. Give yourself a pat on the back and don't ever tell me you don't see things again. That was a great move by Valerie and by Bobby Fisher. Well, Curtis Gardner decides to get cute and play Knight Takes the Pawn on E5. That's inaccurate. Knight E3 is the only way to keep any hope alive. Not sure what he was really going for here. I really don't understand, but that's what he played. Pawn takes the knight, rook takes the pawn, and now we just simplify. We're up a piece. This guy's 1900, so I just really am beside myself trying to figure out what he thought he saw. Knight e3, the only move that keeps the table level. Well, the eval bar says this is hardly level. Yeah, that's true. It's not equal, but it's still the only move that keeps any fight in the position. Let's put it that way. So I'll come back here and hit the next one. Well, knight takes e5 certainly is not the way to go. Pawn takes knight. Rook takes pawn. Queen d2 check is just a quick simplification. And if there was one thing Bobby Fisher was good at, it was simplifying in a winning position. He tried to get cute again with rook e2, x-ray defending. But queen takes queen. Bobby just wants to simplify anyway. And if you wanted to simplify, what would be the move here? If you wanted to finish the simplification, I'm sure you see the move here. It's the same thing. It's just different, isn't it? That's right. Rook check, forking the king and the rook. <laughs> Give yourself two thumbs up. Forces the simplification. A knight and four pawns against five pawns will win every day of the week. Gardner did play one more move, but after knight b1, he resigned. There's no way. I mean, okay, you can move this to safety, but then I'm going to attack this other one, and there's no way to save it. If you try to say, well, at least I have a passed pawn, go ahead and push your passed pawn. As long as my king stays in the square of the pawn, I can stop your pawn without assistance. Meanwhile, your king cannot get into the square of my pawn. So that's that. And therefore, Curtis Gardner resigned.
In fact, the eval bar has for, found a forced checkmate in 57 moves. <laughs> wow. A forced checkmate in 57 moves. Oh, it just dropped it to 33. It found a faster way. Now 27. Now that eval bar, let it think long enough. It'll find a faster checkmate. Now 25. All right, anyway, let's talk about the numbers. Gardner's accuracy was high, 87.8, but Bobby's was way higher, 94.6. The single game rating assessments, 2,400 for Gardner. That's not bad for a 1,900 player to be playing like a 2,400. Of course, Bobby Fisher, 2,700. They both played a decent opening. They both played a decent middle game. Bobby got the better of the middle game, and then for strange reasons, Gardner didn't even try. He just gave away his night for those two pawns, and it was over. But until then, he was playing pretty well.